Hi everyone and welcome to the closing address for today's conference. Um, we'd like to welcome Sean Otto uh, to uh, uh, start our closing address off. Um, Sean Otto is the founder of Science Debate, which is an effort to engage um, presidential candidates in a conversation about politics and science, and it's been going on since 2008. Um, as the largest polit American political initiative in history, um, Otto plans to continue Science Debate for the 2012 election as well, and you can find more information at sciencedebate.org. Otto is also the screenwriter and producer of the film House of Sand and Fog, which you'll be discussing tonight at 7 p.m. in this auditorium. Um, with that, I'd like to welcome Sean Otto. Hi, Raj. Okay, so the first thing, first thing I'd like to do is introduce Rush Holt. Uh, just I'm getting a little feedback. I'll just step back. That might be cross feed from mine. Um, Rush is uh, really, for me anyway, he exemplifies all the qualities of a great scientist statesman, people like Jefferson and Franklin, that really think a lot about the big issues of science and democracy. And this is a guy who really lives at that juncture. There's probably nobody in America that knows more about that uh, than Rush Holt. So we're really lucky to have him here. Rush is, uh, uh, at the time in 2008, was one of two physicists in Congress that became co-chairs of Science Debate 2008. Uh, and I uh, particularly like to talk about Rush and introduce him because he went to Carleton College. As a uh, Minnesota boy, I've always got to get my uh, props on for that. And uh, after that, Rush went to uh, NYU where he got uh, an MA and a PhD in physics. Uh, and he uh, taught physics at Swarthmore. Uh, and <clears throat> additionally, he uh, became a Congressional Science Fellow for Bob Edgar, a congressman out of Pennsylvania, uh, where he really uh, fell in love with, I think, a lot of the juncture. Uh, although it's fair to say that he, uh, like me, uh, was a boundary crosser in a lot of ways early on. While he was at Swarthmore, he taught physics, but also public policy and religion, which are incidentally all topics in, in my book. Uh, he became uh, head of the Nuclear and Scientific Division of the Office of Strategic Forces as a, at the U.S. Department of State, and then the assistant director of the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab before running for Congress uh, and being elected in 1998. So, please welcome Congressman Rush Holt. Thanks, Sean, and uh, it's good to be with you all. Um, maybe there'll be some time for a little bit of uh, interaction after I say a few things. I'd like to learn more about, about this conference. It sounds fascinating. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be there to join you at, at the University of Missouri, but uh, I, uh, uh, well, I'm glad you've made these arrangements so I can interact with you somewhat and share some thoughts over video. Um, it, uh, it always strikes me that scientists take a mischievous glee in dividing the world into uh, as many categories as possible. Uh, you know, different kingdoms of animals, but also different uh, families and genera and, uh, and, and uh, species and so forth. But, uh, and then we go on in astronomy, an area where I've worked, uh, categorizing not only red giants and white dwarfs, but, well, really 70 kinds of stars, not to the uh, barely simmering, or sometimes even counting the failed star superplanets. Uh, scientists uh, even divide themselves. Uh, well, yes, there are physicists, but then there are astrophysicists physicists and geophysicists and nuclear physicists and plasma physicists. Um, I, there's some method to the mass, madness. Uh, classification is a powerful tool. Uh, it does help us by systematizing our knowledge, help us understand it. Um, but sometimes it impedes our thinking. And that's what I wanted to talk about a little bit here. Um, Nature really doesn't distinguish between physics and chemistry and biology. This is something that goes back a century when some of the leading colleges in the country got together 
and decided that uh, for admission to the University of Chicago or Harvard or some of these places, uh, you should have a year of biology followed by a year of chemistry followed by a year of physics. Uh, these are really artificial human subdivisions. You know, nowadays, the physicist who ignores biology is ignoring some of the most fascinating questions uh, that we can turn our physics understanding to. And, I would argue, this is the opportunity to gain insight from, uh, from colleagues who view the world uh, through a different lens. What we call science uh, isn't, or at least shouldn't be, walled off from other ways of thinking about the world. And I gather that's the point of your, of your conference uh, there today. So I uh, applaud you for taking this approach. You know, there's nothing about science that inherently separates it from politics, humanities, economics, engineering. Uh, in fact, each of those fields is poorer if they, uh, for ignoring each other. And, um, Science certainly is poor for ignoring the insights of thinkers from other traditions. Um, uh, Sean mentioned uh, Jefferson and so forth, and I certainly am flattered by the comparison, uh, as far-fetched as it may be. Um, but uh, there's no question that our founding fathers not only valued science, they fought like scientists. Uh, the Federalist Papers, the, you know, the, the essays that led to the ratification of our Constitution used the word experiment 45 times, and by comparison, they used the word democracy only 10 times. Uh, they were thinking like scientists. Uh, they left a legacy for this country that has, that has lasted, really, to this day. When, our, when the GI soldiers went off to Europe, in the First and the Second World War, uh, the, the, the Europeans who interacted with them were struck by their practicality, what they called Yankee ingenuity, uh, the good old American know-how. Uh, it became a cherished uh, virtue, I think, throughout our society, and it traces back to our founders. I think, think traditionally, looking back a century or more ago. Uh, in America, every shopkeeper, every farmer, every manufacturer was thinking about how things work and how to make them better. They were thinking, they, you know, they were tinkering, uh, they were hypothesizing, they were experimenting, they were thinking like scientists. Uh, and really only in recent decades, uh, as America grew industrialized and, and, and scientific practice became professionalized, did science start to be seen as, as foreign or inaccessible to the average American? Uh, it, this uh, division really, I think, uh, became pronounced after Sputnik. Uh, 1957, uh, the Soviets launched this little beeping orb and within months, Congress passed the National Defense Education Act. We said we would reduce a generation of scientists and engineers like the world had never seen. Uh, we did. I'm a product of that uh, National Defense Education Act. Um, and actually, it was deeply a deeply regrettable development because we said to 80% of Americans, if you're not going to be a professional scientist, uh, well, never mind. Um, we did produce a generation of scientists and engineers, the likes of which the world has never seen, and we told most Americans, science isn't for you. Now, I say this as someone who throughout my life has wandered across the barriers that are supposed to separate the fields. Uh, as a student, uh, Sean mentioned uh, the liberal arts college that I attended, Carleton, in Minnesota. I took as many I took courses in as many departments as I could fit into my schedule. As a university teacher, some years later, I taught courses. I taught one course that was co-listed uh, in physics and religion. I taught another course that was co-listed in math, psychology, and physics. 
As a professional, I've worked as a physicist, tinkered a little bit as an inventor, as an academic professor, as a manager, as a diplomat, as a politician. And I, well, regretted sometimes that this meandering seems unusual, or some would call it able. But to me, it's always made sense. I didn't see a disconnect between the fields. My scientific training has prepared me for a number of other projects, even other careers. Because science at its heart is training in how to think, or better, how to ask questions. You know, over the years, I've worked hard to come up with the most concise, meaningful definition I can of science. And it is this. It's a system for asking questions so that they can be answered empirically and verifiably. That captures really all that science is about. And that's a skill set that is as applicable in the U.S. Congress as it is in a laboratory or a particle accelerator research group. Now, the reverse may also be true. Or at least I'd like to think that my experience outside of science, or outside of what is generally defined as science, has made me a better scientist. I'm not doing a lot of science these days, so I guess I haven't been able to test that hypothesis. But I do think that the give and take of politics, even though it may at times seem like the opposite of science, really is a way, at least if you do it right, of opening your mind, or forcing one to open one's mind to very different ideas. The kind of open-mindedness that I think is important for scientific progress. One thing I would say to you students, and again, I think relevant to this, to your conference, is politics requires expertise in communication. That's well known. And so does science. We would be better served as a nation if all scientists could argue coherently for the programs they care about, if they could explain their research interests, if they could describe how their discoveries came about, how they could help society. Anything we can do to help scientists in public communication would be good. And similarly, or conversely, anything that we can do to help politicians communicate comfortably about science would serve as well. If science can improve our politics, and if the practice of politics can strengthen the skills of science, then, well, where are all the scientists' politicians? Right now, out of 435 members of the House, only three are what you might call by a more narrow definition, scientists. Another six are engineers, a few dozen are doctors. That's actually House and Senate, so it's really out of 535 members. There are many different backgrounds. Most of them are smart and successful in their line of work. But 93% of the House of Representatives or the House and Senate, you might say, lack special training in science, medicine, or technical areas. And they, like most Americans who are not trained in those areas, are uncomfortable with them. I think you'll find most of your colleagues at the university there who aren't in science-related areas will admit that they are uncomfortable talking for more than a few minutes about science. So that probably explains why there are so few scientists in Congress. 
but actually, more to the point, um, it's because so few scientists run for Congress. Um, the problem is not that American voters are refusing to elect physicists and chemists. Uh, the problem is really that scientists are refusing to stand for election in the first place. Um, so we should ask ourselves, why do so few scientists run? And obviously, the, the political process seems unfriendly to science. Uh, Sean can talk about this, and in fact, maybe we'll talk about this. Um, many of America's most prominent politicians uh, reject the idea of climate change out of hand. Uh, they don't want to look at the evidence. Uh, the, political, the, the political process uh, doesn't usually deal with evidence. Um, it deals with balancing competing interests. Um, and there is some of that in science, um, but ultimately it's evidence that decides. In politics, it's often the committee chair that, that has the last vote that decides. Um, so if you're going to look at questions of whether vaccines cause autism or uh, other developmental disabilities, uh, you don't do that by a show of hands. Uh, you don't do it by fiat, you know, from the committee chair. You do it by a consensus in the scientific community about the evidence. Um, when things are done that way, you get reliable knowledge, and you get a, a, a better way of dealing with uh, autism in our society and, and so forth. Um, but that is... Uh, well, unfortunately, these abuses uh, are uh, abuses of science or ignorance of science is very wide, widespread in, uh, in the political structure. And of course, to me, they're infuriating uh, because I would hope that every well-educated politician, just like I would hope every well-educated American, would be as comfortable talking about Oh, economics and international affairs, areas in which they may not have special training, as they are comfortable in talking about science. Um, but uh, it's not that way, and that's why scientists need to assert themselves more loudly. Uh, it's why scientists uh, need to run for office. They have to get over, well, I guess I'd say get over it. There is a... There is a uh, a mentality in science that uh, if you go into politics, you'll only end up compromising yourself, and it's dirty. Um, and that's really unfortunate. Um, you know, imagine if scientists, when confronted with political pressure against teaching evolution, had simply backed down. Uh, imagine if scientists, uh, when faced with uh, Big Tobacco's massive campaign of, of, of disinformation and misinformation about the link between smoking and uh, cancer had simply shut up. Uh, it would have been disastrous for our society. Um, you know, I, yes, I wish that we had cracked down on smoking earlier. It's been a very slow process with many needless deaths in the, in the interval. Uh, but ultimately, the evidence has, has or is triumphing. Um, so um, you know, we need uh, more scientists in the public arena, uh, just as we need more scientists uh, adhering to the evidence in their academic uh, teaching and research work. I think another reason that scientists seem reluctant to campaign is that the scientific worldview uh, just seems inapplicable to these consequential debates. Now, the time scales are different. Um, you know, science is a slowly converging uh, series, you might say, uh, and it can take years to converge. Um, but, uh, you know, when the vote comes due on the floor of a legislative body, or when the election comes due, uh, you have to have an answer. Uh, 
You can't say, well, all the data aren't in yet. And again, you have to get over that. Uh, science can tell us the likelihood that a certain method of birth control will prevent pregnancy, but it can't answer the question of when human life begins. Um, you have to draw a distinction between the scientific questions and those other questions that are either beyond science or not yet answered by science. Um, and in the process, you can uh, enrich the debate by shedding some light on those things that can be answered by science. Um, as for non-scientific questions, scientists may not be uh, particularly qualified to draw conclusions. And, and you have to make that point. But you are as qualified as anybody else. And you don't do the, the society or yourself a favor if you say, well, that's not a question that can be answered by science, therefore I won't answer it. Um, you know, you can, you can shed as much light on it as any other concerned citizen, uh, and you should, not claiming special credit as a scientist, but uh, claiming credit as a scientist for those things that, that science can illuminate and um, claiming, uh, claiming standing as a citizen on, on those things uh, where science doesn't have, won't have, or doesn't yet have uh, something definitive to say. Um, it's also troubling, and probably troubling to a lot of you, and discouraging to a lot of would-be scientist politicians, that there's a big divide, divide between the political parties in their approach to science. Um, it's unfortunate, it doesn't need to be, it shouldn't be, uh, but it's real. Uh, there's nothing inherently Republican or Democratic about climate change uh, or space research, uh, but it was, you know, it was a Democratic president that, that, that ignited America's passion for space uh, by declaring a way to the moon. It is you don't have to go beyond the Republican candidates for president this year, um, uh, except for Huntsman, who dropped out fairly early, and, and to realize that the attitude toward climate change is very different um, in the Republican Party uh, and the Democratic Party. Um, it's sadly true. Um, again, you have to get over it. Um, and even as a Republican, uh, you or people you know could run for office as scientists and do a good job. I actually think more people would be more comfortable uh, running as a Democrat. Uh, but I can I can see some uh, some Republicans who you know who, who don't follow the Republican Party line on climate change, for example, and and want to look at the evidence. Right. Um, a question yeah. on that. Uh, yeah. Is it possible right now for a... Is this Sean speaking? Yes, yeah, this is Sean speaking. Is and, actually, and actually, I'd like yeah. to open it up for questions, too. Uh, is it possible yeah, right me, now... Let me, just make a, let me make a few more comments, uh, if I may. Let me just wrap up in just a few more points. Okay, uh, sure. And, just and about this, 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 this one question is just, is it possible for a Republican-leaning scientist right now do you feel to make it through the endorsing process? Um, you know, I think Huntsman, um, for example, probably could have. Now, he's not a scientist, uh, but I'm saying on, on, on that one issue of climate change, which has been something of a uh, of a litmus issue, um, he uh, has. Uh, 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 not followed the Republican Party line. He's been willing to look at the evidence. I think he started sort of late um, in the campaign. So anyway, I, I I'm not sure how how far I want to push that uh, how far I want to push that point. But there is um, uh, there, there's a politicization of science that uh, scientists have to get over 
if they are going to get involved and actually help to heal that uh, political divide. Uh, the stigma against running for office is one that scientists tend to have created ourselves, and uh, it's one that I think we have an obligation to help uh, help end. Um, so part of that is by getting involved, uh, getting involved in various ways. And I mentioned running for office as maybe just the most obvious and symbolic of those. Um, but ultimately, what we need to do is to see that everyone in America gets science. Uh, everyone in America is comfortable dealing with science, even if they are not expert in it. Uh, that everyone in America um, understands how to ask questions so they can be answered empirically and verifiably. In other words, so that everybody in America is comfortable applying evidence to the questions and problems uh, that they face. So, I, again, I'm, I'm really pleased that you're holding this conference. I thank you for including me. Um, it sounds to me like you are working down the artificial barriers that separate scientists from the rest of society and from politics. Um, and I wish you uh, the, the, the best success in that. So, Sean, um, with regard to your question, I, I, there's not that much more I have to say. I, I don't want to belabor the point. There is a difference between the parties. It's not a, 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 a um, unbridgeable difference. Um, I think the bigger chasm is between scientists and non-scientists, uh, rather than between um, scientists of one political persuasion and another. Does anyone have any questions for Congressman? Thank you. Yep. Are you can ask a question now? About We've got a few questions for yeah, you. Could, could you Which, my question yeah, could you manage that? Yeah, actually, I'll, I'll pass it on to, to Bill Horner, and we'll, we'll manage that. Actually, my question is going to tag off of Sean, if he wants to ask his question about, about being a Republican and getting through the process, and then I'll ask mine. Do you want to ask that again? Do you want to ask that question? Oh, go ahead. He, he kind of covered it. But. Okay. Congressman, thank you again for, uh, for being here. Uh, this tags off of Sean's earlier question about uh, being a conservative Republican and getting through the Congress, uh, getting through the vetting process. And um, I'm reluctant to admit this, but I am a proud Missouri uh, MU alum, scientist, and engineer uh, with three engineering degrees. I'm also a conservative, uh, and I carefully evaluated Huntsman uh, during his uh, campaign, and certainly the science to me. Um, him. But I think one thing that's lost when, when the scientific community looks at politics, uh, and in one of the statements earlier today, there was a comment about the, the anti-intellectualism that seems to be rising among the, the conservative movement, is, uh, and maybe you can comment on this, there's, there's an important difference between looking at the evidence uh, of whatever the scientific issue is, and then speculating about a solution, uh, and a solution that's workable, and effective, for example, is, is the sun responsible for global warming? Is, is man, our man-made causes responsible for global warming? And I think that uh, the solution you know, has to target the cause and then doesn't harm us in other ways. It doesn't uh, make kings and peasants you know, by moving money around and harming us in, in ways that aren't desirable. And I think that's where uh, there's more of the politics that come in. And I think we've seen scientists step into an advocacy role and away from science take uh, risk to undermining their credibility. Maybe that's something you, since you have experience with, you can comment on. Thank you. Yeah, well, um, I, I, I did want to make the point that scientists should not avoid advocacy. Um, you have to be clear what is based on evidence and uh, what is based on extrapolation and what is based on statements of value. Uh, of values, um, but it is uh, you're not doing anybody any favors to stay out of it. Uh, I think, uh, and it can be done in a way that does not 
uh, in any way compromise uh, one science. Um, the um, science can't answer the major questions of society, but they but it certainly can put limits on possible solutions. There are some things that are just you know, the, the evidence shows you it's just not going to work. Or the evidence shows you that's just not where the problem lies. Um, and so, uh, and of course, evidence, you know, one, one person's evidence is, a, is another person's uh, hearsay, I guess. Um, and, and that's why you, you want to look at the process. And Scientific truth is something that a uh, consensus of informed practitioners uh, forms around. And uh, scientists are, you know, by the way, much more comfortable with uncertainty. Uh, every working physicist knows it's, it's driven into our uh, into our thinking early on that. All of our work can be overturned by a patent clerk in Switzerland. Uh, that, 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 you know, that everything we do is provisional. Uh, as I said, it's a slowly converging series, uh, usually, uh, and you're never quite there. But it doesn't mean all bets are off. And one hypothesis is as good as another, one solution to a public problem is as good as another. No, the evidence does help us narrow uh, consider. And, uh, you know, with, uh, to, to well, dwell on climate change for a little bit longer, it is possible that uh, there are some subtle changes in the magnetic fields of the sun that are changing atmospheric circulation. Um, you know, there, there's some correlation and some interesting uh, atmospheric, uh, the sunspot cycle. But, you know, as best thousands and thousands of scientists can tell, it's not radiation. It's a blanketing effect from greenhouse uh, gases that trap heat uh, under, under this blanket uh, of the atmosphere. And um, so, therefore, we shouldn't just throw up our hands and say, oh, this is just the Milankovitch cycle, or uh, uh, is that the name of it? Anyway, whatever that astronomical cycle is. Um, um, but we should say, as, as best we can tell with the evidence in front of us, this is cumulus, or a large part of it, uh, that is affecting humans in expensive and deadly ways, and we should look for um, uh, solutions in the, uh, in, in the realm of human behavior. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, that, that's what I mean. It's not, uh, it, you, know, there, you won't find in, in many areas a definitive answer from science, whether it's the vaccine autism connection uh, or something else. I mean, it certainly, um, on vac vac vaccine autism, it certainly changed the debate. It turned out that the principal research paper on which this purported link uh, between vaccines and autism rested was fraudulent. Um, that kind of changed the debate a lot. Um, but if it had fraudulent, we still be likely, best the evidence uh, you can tell, was that the vaccines don't cause autism. Con Congressman, this is uh, Bill Horner. I'm here in the political science department. And uh, I want to thank you very much for uh, doing this for us today. We have uh, Sean, who is ready to uh, give his presentation. So I think Good. it's all right. Move, so we'll move, move on to Sean's presentation. And, and thank you so very much for uh, joining us and for the statement that you sent us. And we've distributed all day. So we really appreciate your perspective. Okay. On well, if, if you want to uh, uh, 
darken my picture so I don't distract from Sean, I happily listen in, and uh, and maybe if if there's discussion to be had afterwards, I'd be available to join in that. All right, well, thank you very much, Congressman. Okay, thanks again for coming and <clears throat> for participating in this great conference. Thanks for having me here, Bill, and the uh, rest of the poli sci department. Um, so, uh, jumping off of some of the things that Rush uh, talked about, I want to explore a little bit more of this relationship between science, democracy, and politics, uh, particularly that's been going on in the last uh, 30 or 40 years in, in our country. Whenever the people are well informed, Thomas Jefferson said, they can be trusted with their own government. And this is kind of the key uh, precept in a lot of my thinking and in, in, in uh, some of the reasons behind, for instance, Science Debate 2008. The question is, is what happens now when science has advanced so far and become so complex that it is influencing every aspect of life in ways that many people can't understand when the iPhone is effectively the same thing as magic. Can the people still be trusted uh, with their own government? And let's take a look at this with an example from the political left. Uh, Taking cell phones, uh, one common, and and Rush is very familiar with this, uh, diagram the the, uh, EMF uh, scale. So one common claim on the left uh, is that cell phones cause brain cancer. Uh, The radiation from cell phones is dangerous. And uh, anytime that you hear the word radiation, you better watch out. Uh, This is actually a common theme throughout uh, much of the thinking about the left, which is geared around hidden dangers uh, in healthcare, particularly. Uh, But I wanted to point out that microwaves, which is what cell phones use, actually have less energy than the infrared radiation that your skin gives off. In fact, microwaves, which are about as long as roughly a bumblebee, you could say, um, have about a million times less energy than the ultraviolet radiation that can knock an electron out of an atom ionizing that carbon atom and damaging our DNA. And that's the cause of cancer, is damaged strands of DNA. Uh, That's called ionizing radiation. So why all the fear over microwaves? Partly, maybe it's because we cook with them, right? So there's a nice appetizing bunch of peas here in the strainer about to go in the microwave, without the strainer, of course. But let's just look (laughs) at one P. Now, one P is about 1.4 grams in mass. So I was wondering, just I was looking for a comparison. What's a million times more than 1.4 grams? A BMW Z4. According to the manufacturer's weight spec, it's about 1,400 kilograms. So think about that difference in force that a P can apply versus a BMW Z4, right? They're both mass, so why shouldn't we be equally afraid of them? Now here's a line of Z4s. <coughs> Which would you think would be more likely to knock one of them out of the row? A P or a drunk driver driving another Z4? 
Well, that's kind of similar to what happens in Einstein. Actually, that Swiss patent clerk won his 1921 Nobel Prize for this insight that energy actually travels in packets. And a photon, uh, the, the amount of energy necessary to knock a photon out of orbit, or an electron in this case out of orbit, uh, is about a million times more uh, than a microwave. So let's look at some of the uh, mistakes that we've made around this because we can't see it, because it's not concrete. So then we become afraid of it. And one of the mistakes that we've made, for instance, is this last year as WHO, World Health Organization, issued a report saying that it's possible that microwaves do cause brain cancer. Despite the fact that broad epidemiological studies had shown no link, they issued this report. They got headlines around the world talking about this. But if you actually read the report in the footnote, it said, actually, it's indistinguishable from chance. They noticed a small little blip, but statistically, it was indistinguishable from chance. So, I wrote an article about this that I took all kinds of criticism for, particularly from people on the left, health advocates. Uh, and I was talking, I was, I was in fact criticizing the San Francisco City Council, the Board of Supervisors there. Uh, all Democrats voted 10 to 1 to require cell phone shops to post warnings that your cell phone may be giving you brain cancer. Now that's an example of regulation that is not founded on knowledge. And that's a good example of the juncture between science and policy making. But I'm going to get back to this theme of regulation again later on in the talk because it's a very important question. Uh, regulations become a bad word in our society, but it isn't necessarily so. Now, let's look at an example from the political right. Uh, Rush has talked about this, and we had a question about it. Let's talk about climate change, because that's a favorite political football on the right right now. So this is a diagram called the Arctic Sea Ice Extent. Uh, this is the September uh, measure, and it's usually measured in September because that's uh, when the Arctic Sea Ice is lowest. Uh, every year. And you can see how it has been going down and down and down and down and down. In fact, this last year was the second lowest Arctic sea ice on record. Now if we take that and we highlight it and we invert it, we could call it the Arctic open water extent. That's the inverse function of that, right? Now let's, let's take a look at that open water extent, which has been climbing in September, and compare it to some other charts. For instance, this is the level of atmospheric CO2. This is called the Keeling Curve. It was measured by Charles Keeling starting in 1958 at Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. And he noticed a strange thing. Every year as plants grew in the northern hemisphere, the amount of CO2 fell in the spring and summer. And every year in the fall and winter as they died and decomposed, it went back up. But the strange thing is, is every year, it went a little bit higher. So that started lots and lots of scientists, atmospheric scientists and geophysicists, going into the field, trying to understand what could be happening, whether or not it really was, as some have suspected, related to our burning of fossil fuels. And in the 50 years since then, thousands and thousands of scientists have conducted experiments. It's one of the most experimented fields ever. Here is another chart. The US declared disasters by year. These are federal disasters. Uh, notice any similarities? How about when we compare global temperatures in the pink? Any similarities? Now, the Koch brothers, uh, famous for their owning you know, the second largest privately held uh, U.S. corporation, Koch Industries, uh, were funded part of the research called the Berkeley Earth uh, Surface Temperature Assay. And uh, they found, sure enough, pretty much the same thing last year. Uh, so you have to give, actually, uh, Richard Muller, the physicist uh, that was in charge of that, a lot of uh, credit for uh, being skeptical uh, the way that we want scientists to be skeptical. He was uh, skeptical of the data. Uh, he went out and tested it. And he, in fact, found that it's, uh, it is exactly pretty much as everybody else had been measuring. So that's the data on 
on this uh, favorite football from the political right, but it doesn't necessarily intersect with our policy discussion right now. For instance, Rush Limbaugh. I know he's a favorite son in Missouri, up for an election to the Hall of Fame, I right hear. Uh, says that this is a worldwide hoax. And his primary target was you, the people of the United States of America, as if it's a political thing and you're being duped and you're the target. Uh, the greatest hoax, said uh, James Inhofe, and actually I think these, it's Nick Candace who's in Oklahoma. See, you can always make mistakes. Uh, ever perpetrated on the American people. It's very similar, actually, to interesting language uh, from Weimar Germany in the 1920s, uh, where there were, it was such a thing called a right-wing relativity denier. Now, we have climate denial, that, that was relativity denial. They attacked Einstein's theory as Jewish science, and they said it was a big hoax. Einstein was just in it for the money. Einstein at the time said, this world is a strange madhouse. Currently, every coachman and every waiter is debating whether or not relativity theory is correct. Belief in this matter depends on political party affiliation. So my point in all this is that science is always political. In fact, there are two key concepts that I want you to think about. Science is never partisan. It's always about knowledge. It's about measuring reality. But it's always political. Now here's a chart that I put in my book to get people to break down this left-right thinking that they often do in politics between as conservatives and liberals, or as conservatives and progressives. Really, politics breaks down in more of a plane. And there is a distinct difference between authoritarians and anti-authoritarians. Now, science is inherently anti-authoritarian. It doesn't take anything on faith. It looks at evidence. It says, I'm going to test this for myself. I don't care if the king or the pope says it's this way. I'm going to check it out. There are certain religions that are authoritarian, certain forms of government also that are authoritarian. Right now, I would posit that a lot of what's going on in our society is an argument between authoritarian and anti-authoritarian approaches to government. This is why what makes the Tea Party so interesting, and why some people are actually comparing the Tea Party and the 99% and saying, you know, in some ways they have there's some overlap there. Uh, because both of them have some anti-authoritarian aspects to them. However, a lot of the Tea Party actually in their embrace of, of some of the uh, uh, more conservative religion aspects, social conservatism, uh, have moved away from that. But I want you to think about, for instance, moderate Republicans. Where would you think that they would be? What quadrant? Typically they'd be up here, right? They're a little bit more about evidence and a little bit less about uh, structure. Uh, science, however, is both left and right. Scientist is going to hold on to evidence. He's not going to stick his neck out there uh, because he could ruin his career if he made a claim that he couldn't back up. He's going to check through all the papers that have been published on a topic before he publishes or she publishes. But he's also progressive in that he's willing to go where the evidence leads. Okay. Why? Because knowledge is power. Knowledge is power in two different ways. First of all, new knowledge always forces ethical reflection. The issues that Russia talked about about the beginning of life is one. And this is where science often bumps up against religion. Questions about, uh, for instance, uh, when is someone pregnant? Uh, what is an abortion? Uh, is uh, the morning after pill, and you know, does that cause an abortion, or is that birth control? All these ethical uh, parsings that we have to do as we extend our ability to see smaller and smaller and finer and finer, and understand more and more detail. That means that we have to consider the ethics of all that new knowledge, and that's inherently a painful process that involves politics. <coughs> Another way that that Science is political, and it's also around power. Uh, this is all based on Bacon's uh, observation that knowledge is power. New knowledge either supports or challenges vested interests uh, or beliefs. And this is true whether or not those vested interests are uh, economic. Uh, for instance, in the case of climate change, uh, if it is caused by human behavior, there are vast economic questions and policy questions that we have to work through. 
Those are extremely threatening, uh, particularly if you have built up an industry around uh, previous, pre-existing science. Uh, and now new science comes along and says, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, but also, uh, sometimes they challenge, again, our belief uh, structure. If the Bible says that the Earth is uh, you know, 6,500 years old, uh, and yet we can uh, figure out through radiocarbon dating that it's 4.4 billion years old, uh, what does that mean? What does that mean about our interpretation? What does it mean about our faith? What does it mean about science? What does it mean about the difference between belief and knowledge? All those things are challenging, and that's political. So really, think about the, our, our basic forms of governance uh, with relationship to science then. There are authoritarian structures in government, and there are anti-authoritarian. Examples of authoritarian are theocracy, monarchy, and totalitarian states, right? Uh, anti-authoritarian structures, democracy. <laughs> Like that one? I'm glad somebody got that. Uh, and, of course, anarchy. And I put a little asterisk at, after anarchy because it's not really a form of government uh, that's really advocating for a total individual freedom. But when we think about it, that's not what our founding fathers were about, right? Because government is really about our figuring out ways to deal with our shared common interests. So, American-style democracy really grew out of science, as Rush talked about. Many of the founding fathers were scientist statesmen. Jefferson uh, was, he measured the temperature, he measured an eclipse of the sun, he carried a thermometer with him all the time, he took detailed notes. Uh, uh, Franklin was the most famous scientist in America and uh, in, probably in the world at the time. Uh, now, in drafting the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson really turned to the scientists and lawyers, many of them were both, uh, that he uh, admired, uh, because he wanted to make certain that this document was unassailable. And his trinity of three greatest men were Newton, who talked about the difference between imagination and truth. Newton said, you can imagine things that are false, but you can only understand things that are true. That was how he made the distinction. That I thought was pretty interesting, particularly because Newton actually wrote far more about theology uh, than he did about science. Bacon was the Attorney General for England, uh, and after a long uh, career uh, there, he turned to science, uh, and he wrote something called Novum Organum, the new instrument, uh, turning over the whole idea of deductive reasoning uh, that Descartes had come up with and that the Greeks had come up with, I think therefore I am, uh, and saying, no, we've got to start with observation and evidence and creating the groundwork for what became empiricism. This is why, for instance, Rush says science is, is not ever uh, certain about anything. You have to be comfortable with uncertainty, because in inductive reasoning you say, I'm going to look at the world and gather evidence, and because every single swan I see is white, I'm going to say all swans not are white, but all swans are probably white. And that's how statistics and math come in science, and that's why inductive reasoning and science never makes absolute statements, because we can't observe the whole world. So scientists are just being intellectually honest when they say, we can't observe everything, so we're not going to tell you for sure, because something might come along, a black swan might come along, and sure enough, there were black swans discovered in Australia. Uh, and then John Locke. And John Locke developed, and he's really credited as the father of empiricism. He took kind of Bacon's ideas and really develop them further. He noticed that, particularly uh, in the Protestant church, there was all this argument between different sects about who was the one true church. And between the Protestant church and the Catholic church at the time, you know, who, who was the true church there? They thought, you know, there has to be a way to figure out what is really true. And he developed a test, a uh, three-point test, to define what knowledge really is. And that became the basis of empiricism. He said anything that doesn't meet one of these tests is but faith or opinion, but not knowledge. So Jefferson was really drawing on these ideas because if you can observe the world for yourself and you can come to firm conclusions about it based on inductive reasoning and observation, then you don't need a king or a pope to tell you what is true. Okay? You can test it for yourself. And if that was the case, then kings or popes didn't have any greater claim on power than anybody in this room. 
And that was the basis for the idea of democracy, was that each one of us has the th same level of authority as the king of England or the pope in Rome. That we can figure out reality for ourselves using the tools of observation and science. And if we can do that, we needed a form of government that respected our individual capacity. And in, this is a copy of an early draft of the Declaration of Independence. And there's one thing in here that I wanted to point out to you, because it kind of encapsulates those ideas that Jefferson was struggling with. Uh, he, he early wrote the draft saying, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that, uh, or no, he didn't, I'm sorry. He, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable that all men are created equal. Now, that's an interesting catch. He showed it to uh, Franklin, uh, who was one of the three people that was working with him on this. And Franklin said, no, that is resorting to the authority argument again. And he struck those lines out and put in the words self-evident. He said, if we can make that solid claim that it is self-evident, we can construct an argument, as Locke argued, uh, to bring the, the mind to the point at which it bottoms. Uh, if we're not resorting to God, if we're saying that it's self-evident that all men are created equal, then people of differing faiths cannot argue with that. Uh, a theocratic government, uh, or the king in England, uh, who is uh, the head of the church there too, can't argue with it. Can't say, no, I'm closer to God. It was a way of protecting the new republic and creating a means of government that the leaders of the rest of the world had to respect. Now, in doing that, Franklin was drawing, and this is a really important point, on the idea of self evidence that came from David Hume. Hume always talked about that. And David Hume was a friend of Franklin's, and he was also uh, the mentor of Adam Smith, who wrote Wealth of Nations. And he defined freedom. And this was the American idea of freedom that these guys drew on. The American idea of freedom is freedom to choose. A man who said may choose to do something or not to do something. There is no boss telling him that you have to do this. There is no king saying you have to do this. No despot. He has freedom of choice as an individual. Freedom of choice is what the founding fathers meant when they said, we have freedom in America. So think about freedom now and all these legacy science challenges that are coming up from the science of the last 30, 40, 50, even 100 years. A lot of these things have to do with this juncture between individual freedom and freedom limitations caused by our collective action. Okay, so that conflict that Ayn Rand wrote so well about the, between the individual and the collective. Individualism and collectivism. And the United States is a very individualistic country, which is why it's been so difficult for us to grapple with so many of these science-driven problems as our technology has boomed and made us so powerful and so economically successful and so able to change our environment, we begin to bump up against certain limits. And many of these policy issues, politicians don't want to talk about because of those implications about personal behavior and because it's so difficult to talk about that boundary between individualism and collectivism in a successful way in our political sphere. So it's made us quite stuck. Now I want you to think about this. Over the next 40 years, because science is no longer an American enterprise, Scientists have expanded throughout the world. They're coming here still, because we still have the best universities, but now they're more and more often going back home and founding their own universities or institutions there, or just teaching at existing ones, and they're connected through the internet. So there's really no geographical requirements. Like business, science has gone global. And because of this huge increase in the number of scientists and their interconnectivity, over the next 40 years, science is poised to make as much new knowledge as we have over the last 400 years. That's as much new power. Because again, think about it. What does knowledge really provide us with? It provides us with freedom of choice. New knowledge gives us new power. And that power is the power to choose to do things or not. It's the power to multiply the productivity of our farms by 35 times. It's the power even over life and death. Our average lifespan has doubled in the last 140 years because of science. 
So imagine the political quandaries that we're going to be facing just in the next half century. So the question is, is are the people still well enough informed to be trusted in their own government? <coughs> I love this picture. The brain more is, oh, you're saying. Uh, and maybe, you know, and maybe Congress will save us. Uh, and that's, uh, maybe, uh, judging from the picture, probably not. But uh, I'm sure Rush never played uh, solitaire. Uh, and, but as he pointed out, of the 535 members of Congress, only nine have any kind of background in anything really professionally related to science. There's one physicist, and you just heard from him, one chemist, six engineers, and a microbiologist. By contrast, how many do you suppose are lawyers who go to <laughs> duck science? <laughs> 222. So it's little wonder that we have more horse trading and rhetoric driven conversations in Congress than we do evidence-driven conversations, because a lawyer is trained to make the best argument that he or she can by cherry-picking those facts that fit the predetermined conclusion that you're arguing for. And then you leave it up to the judge, or the jury, or, in this case, the rest of Congress as the jury, to decide who's got the strongest argument, who's right. But that really has nothing to do with evidence, at least not a full consideration of the evidence. It has to do with rhetoric. So consider how this is, all of this, is, is having an impact in our discussions, in our political dialogue in this country. And I'm going to use the climate change issue again because we picked it up because it's such a hot button this, this year. 94 of the 100 new GOP lawmakers, many of them backed by, by the Tea Party, uh, have either denied climate change is actually even happening or signed pledges to block mitigation. Uh, now, this is an example of, of some of the conversation that's going on. John Shimkus from Illinois, Chairman of the House Subcommittee on Environment and the Economy. The earth will end only when God declares it's time to be over. Uh, man will not destroy this earth. This earth will not be destroyed by a flood. And I appreciate having panelists here who are men of faith, and we can get into the theological discourse of, of that position. But I do believe God's word is infallible, unchanging, perfect. Uh, two other issues, Mr. Chairman. Today we have about 388 parts per million in the atmosphere. I think in the area of the dinosaurs, where we had most flora and fauna, we were probably at 4,000 parts per million. There is a theological debate that this is a carbon star plant. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't remember reading about carbon dioxide in the Bible. <laughs> and incidentally, that's the book that he's got there, the Bible. Um, I also don't think that this is a conservative position. My family founded the Minnesota Republican Party. Uh, but I don't think any of them would think of this as a conservative position either. This is an authoritarian position. This is re relying on the Bible to make, to hold, uh, it, it, as he's chairing, an evidence-based hearing on climate change. It doesn't really make any sense. Uh, now, let's see how the second most powerful man in America views the issue. We have to deal with this in a responsible way. So, are you, so what is the responsible way? That's my question. What is the Republican plan to deal with carbon emissions, which every major scientific organization has said is contributing to climate change. George, the idea that carbon dioxide uh, is, is a carcinogen that is harmful to our environment is, is almost comical. Every time yes, we yes. exhale, we exhale carbon dioxide. Uh, every cow in the world, uh, you know, when they do what they do, you've got more carbon dioxide. It's hard to know even where to begin with that one. <laughs> Cows don't part carbon dioxide, I guess. That's where I'd start, probably. Uh, yeah, I don't know. But I, I don't think that there is any scientist out there who's actually ever said that carbon dioxide is a carcinogen, either. Uh, the concerning thing is, again, John here is, uh, Congressman Boehner, is uh, in charge of the flow of legislation through the House, right? 
So how are we going to have reasoned debate about it when this man knows so little about it? I think it's incumbent on him to know more. Uh, so the question is, is why is science uh, intimidating these politicians? And it's not just Tea Party types, it's not just Republicans. Uh, last, uh, about uh, last month, there was this big discussion of SOPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act uh, in Congress. And there was some footage here uh, from members of both parties. From my perspective, just as an old country boy, um, and, you know, this, this just... That's the only way I can understand this complex stuff. We need parallels on the virtual, in the virtual world to what we have in the real world. And I think this bill draws the appropriate balance. I, I'm not a nerd. I am not a nerd. It's not just not enough of a nerd. Maybe we ought to ask some nerds what this thing really does. <laughs> Let's have a nerd bring in the nerds. <laughs> says, when is being a nerd a really bad thing? These guys are all falling over themselves to say I'm not a nerd. That probably makes Rush feel really bad. Uh, <clears throat> there's something going on in our politics where we don't want to appear smarter than anybody if we're running for our Congress, right? Don't want to be up on our high horse. Don't want to be too intellectual, one of those defeat intellectual Europeans. And so everybody's anxious to not be a nerd, right? I'm just one of the people. But past the point, this gets ridiculous, because we elect these people actually to solve problems, right? So here they are, discussing one of the more important bills of the year, uh, and uh, none of them can say a word about it. Well, maybe the president will save us. Well, in 2008, we thought maybe just that, and we worked on putting together the Science Debate 2008, this effort to get the candidates for president in his open seat to talk about these big science issues that have been sitting unresolved for 20, 30 years now. Some of them, in fact, arguably the most important issues the country is facing, and yet nobody was talking about them. Well, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton uh, had many opportunities. We were discussing this with them, and we actually uh, worked with the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia, uh, named after Benjamin Franklin. They were going to host it. Uh, we had PBS lined up to broadcast it. David Brancaccio was going to moderate. And they turned us down at the last minute, about a week, week ahead of time, week and a half ahead of time. And instead, what did they do? They went to the Compassion Forum at Messiah College in Harrisburg, uh, Pennsylvania. So this is a very interesting juxtaposition, because I remember when I was a kid anyway, there were three things you never talked about. It was sex, politics, and religion. Nowadays, religion really is not a taboo topic. What has happened where science is more taboo for politicians to talk about than religion? So I want you to think about that interesting dynamic again, and about that tug of war between authority and anti-authority in our politics. Well, maybe the president's opponents will say us that. Everybody's laughing already. It's no fair. There's a woman who came up crying to me tonight after the debate. She said her daughter was given that vaccine. She told me her daughter suffered mental retardation as a result of that vaccine. There are very dangerous consequences. It's not good enough to take, quote, a mulligan where you want a do-over, not when you have little children's lives at risk. Man-made global warming is poppycock. I hope I can say that on your show. You know you can. In well, other words, doesn't. I don't believe in it. Look, look, if people look at the real data, the climate has varied ever since we have known that the planet was here. And we know that those scientists who try to concoct the science to say that we had a hockey stick global warming and they were busted because they manipulated the data. No, if man-made global warming is not a crisis. Now, Herman Cain lived in Minnesota for quite a while, and it actually was uh, quite a successful executive there, going out through the Pillsbury chain uh, command, uh, and was really well respected. What is going on in his thinking to make this uh, very well-regarded uh, industry leader uh, take these anti-science positions? For evolution to explain the creation of the human species from nothing to human beings, okay. absolutely not. I don't believe in that. HPV, uh, forcing 12-year-old girls to 
to take an inoculation uh, to prevent this sexually transmitted disease. This is not good medicine, I, I do not believe. I think it's social, uh, social misfit, and, and not so, it's, it, but I'm opposed to getting involved in the process of, of uh, killing children in order to get, uh, to have research materials. And I think you're finding, if you look at what's happening with stem cell research, we have less and less demand that you have anything except regular stem cells because we're learning how to use them. Now, I think everyone can probably agree with this position. <laughs> I, too, am opposed to killing children for research. <laughs> Well, what's curious about this is that Newt, um, he's had a, a more recent stumble in the polls about science that I'm not going to go into right now, but Newt was a big supporter of Science Debate 2008. Uh, and in fact, uh, he told me, you know, I'll do anything I can to support science. And he's got somewhat of a checkered history with that. Rush can talk about how he uh, gutted the uh, um, OTA, the Office of Technology Assessment, which was science, uh, Congress's science advisory body. Uh, but then again, he also uh, supported doubling of the research funding for the National Institutes of Health. Uh, what was happening at this moment in time was he was really slipping in the polls. And after this pretty blatant anti-science position, uh, he took a bounce. Uh, so th there is something going on in the dynamics this year that we need to think about. You yourself have said the party is in danger of becoming anti-science. Who on the stage is anti-science? Listen, when you, when you make comments that fly in the face of what 98 out of 100 climate scientists have said, when you call into question the science of evolution, all I am saying is that in order for the Republican Party to win, we can't run from science. It didn't work out so well for me, did it? Governor Perry, uh, Governor Perry, Governor Hoffman was not specific about names, but the two of you do have a difference of opinion about climate change. Just recently in New Hampshire, you said that weekly or even daily, scientists are coming forward to question the idea that human activity is behind climate change. Which scientists have you found most credible on this subject? Well, I do agree that uh, there is, the science is, is not settled on this. The idea that we would put Americans' economy at, at, at jeopardy, uh, based on scientific theory that's not uh, settled yet, it, to me is just it, is nonsense. I mean, it, it, I mean and, I, and I tell somebody, I said, just because you have a group of scientists that have stood up and said, here is the fact, Galileo got uh, outvoted for a spell. You're right, by, by people like him. Uh, now, I should say that not only does the National Academy of Sciences say that it's supported by so many lines of data that should be regarded as having facts, Every other National Academy of Science in the world says the same thing, and in fact, almost uh, every other scientific, major scientific organization. I don't uh, speak for the scientific community, of course, um, but I believe the world is getting warmer. I, 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 I can't prove that, uh, but I believe, based on what I read, that the world, the world is getting warmer. Uh, and, and number two, I believe the humans contribute to that. Now, notice on this one I put pre-rush Romney. Uh, and this gets at the point I'm trying to make, because the very next day, Rush went on his radio show and said this. Bye-bye nomination. Bye-bye nomination. Another one down. Uh, we're, we're, we're in the midst here of discovering that this is all hoax. The last year has established that the whole premise of man-made global warming is a hoax. So one in the nomination, Romney adjusted his rhetoric. Do I think the world's getting hotter? Yeah, I don't know that, but I, I think it is. Uh, I'm not a scientist. Do I think we contribute to it? I don't know by how much. I, you, you, you said you're, you're not you're not the boss of me, as my kids used to say to me. All right, all right. So, so you said you said it's all caused by humans. It's mostly caused by humans. All right. I don't know if it is or it's not. So why is this a conservative bona fide? Thing? What what has happened to make denial of what all the leading atmospheric scientists say, denial essentially of our best version of reality into a political requirement in one of our major parties. Well, maybe the media will get to the bottom of this. Well, think again. In January of 2008, the TV's top five news anchors asked the questions, uh, I'm sorry, asked the candidates questions, uh, and, sorry, getting a little tired here. In 171 interviews, they conducted 2,975 questions. Uh, how many do you suppose 
even mention the words climate change or global warming? Any Ten. guesses? Ten. Ten? Six. Six? Somebody's cheating. <laughs> Six. I did buy the book. Uh, <laughs> three, to put that in perspective, mention UFOs. <laughs> so that's the relative level of importance that the media has given this topic in our political discussion. Uh, why is that? Why would it be that so many journalists don't think that these science issues, big science issues, are important? Probably because most of them, like politicians, duck science classes in college. Uh, there's a problem, though, with this approach to reality. In journalism, there's always two sides to every story. It's called the conflict brain, right? Bob says 2 plus 2 is 4, Julie says it's 6, the conflict brain is. You've got a story then, right? But in science, most times, one side is simply wrong. I can show you using these apples that Bob's clearly right. That's what the evidence all shows, right? We can see it with our eyes. Now, when we can't see it with our eyes, when we rely on the complex instruments of science, <coughs> it becomes more important because then people feel like they're taking scientists at their word, which is why I tell scientists, you've got to emphasize the process. You've got to show them how you do it to make it concrete for them. Now, politics takes a different approach to reality. How about a compromise? <laughs> right? A new law, now. 2 plus 2 equals 5. The problem is that this has very real-world consequences. False balance weights our political dialogue towards extremes by balancing scientists from the mainstream center with the one outlier or the two outliers. All of a sudden, then, the whole argument is not centered in the middle. We don't have a balanced he said, she said. We have a balance of 100 people on one side of the teeter-totter being artificially propped up by one guy on the other side of the teeter-totter and the power of the media. So all of a sudden, it doesn't matter what the issue is, whether it's on the left and it's vaccine denial, or if it's cell phones cause brain cancer, or if it's on the right and it's climate change, or evolution and science class, whatever the, the pet hobby and horse of the day is, it doesn't help us actually arrive at a balanced position in our dialogue in this country right now. An example of that would be David Gregory's coverage. He was the chief White House correspondent for NBC. Uh, and he was asked, how come none of you people in the White House press corps pushed President Bush harder about the fact that we really didn't have any evidence whatsoever uh, that there were uh, weapons of mass destruction before going into Iraq? And his answer was, I respectfully disagree. It's not our role. Well, if it's not the press's role to ask the tough questions so that the public dialogue can process the discussion, whose role is it? What is happening in democracy then? Are we having a short circuit? Now, here's an example of this uh, in action. This is actually from a pretty good online uh, newspaper, and I don't mean to pick on them, it's just that I happen to have access to their new reporter guidelines. And their new reporter guidelines, like many uh, guidelines on the left, where there's this thing called postmodernism that came up in reaction to science and the humanities, saying that your truth is just as good as my truth, and who am I to judge yours? It got wrapped up in civil rights and, and, and identity politics. Uh, but most of, of our journalism schools and our education schools are taught this kind of thinking. Here it is right here. There is no such thing as objectivity. This is new reporter guidelines for a major newspaper, news outlet, right? Well, if you believe that, how are you ever going to dig to get at the truth? You're not, right? You're just going to publish different competing sides, and the loudest argument wins. Well, if the loudest argument wins, what is that? That's authoritarianism, right there. Our media is helping us drift into this in the United States, and it's a dangerous time for us. So I want you to think about Jefferson's virtuous circle of democracy and how he envisioned policy would work. We would have a government issue. Some issue would come up. How are we going to handle our affairs together, the parts where our affairs uh, intermingle, like building roads or dealing with some public policy about disease or taxation? All right, we have this issue, and 
we rely on the educated and informed mass of the people. And Jefferson argued it took no very great degree of education for them to be educated and informed. Well, that was 200 years ago when science was uh, a lot less sophisticated than it is now. <clears throat> then you go out and do scientific research to build knowledge. And based on that knowledge, you debate the best public policy decisions. <coughs> right? That's the way it's supposed to work. Right? Well, what happens? Now, instead, we have a lot of vested interests that are providing alternative theories and alternative information to children in schools and propaganda to adults. And it's short-circuiting that circle of democracy. Okay, so the educated and informed mass of the people gets moved off to the side. Scientists are really no longer part of the conversation, and we don't value science. Okay, instead we turn to authority and ideology for knowledge. Uh, instead of debating the best policy uh, based on science, we debate it based on dogma. We thump our Bibles in our congressional hearings. Uh, and the, uh, the role of knowledge and evidence in making public policy is also sidelined. Well, what is that really a recipe for? <laughs> Again, authoritarianism. Because the evidence cycle is moved out of the democratic discussion. And instead, we are going based on dogma. And who is setting the agenda with the dogma? The people that can afford to broadcast their vested interests out there. So this is causing a lot of confusion in our public dialogue. And I wanted to give you one example from this last weekend. Uh, this was talking about the whole Russian, the tail end of it. I'm not going to show you the part where they were talking about the whole Sandra Fluke thing and Rush Limbaugh and whether he should or shouldn't have done that. Um, this is a part talking about contraception at the very end. Was, I thought it was a very interesting debate. Donna, i got to say, uh, what, whether or not, let's just call it birth control, not abortifacients and sterilization, whether or not birth control uh, coverage under insurance companies is desirable, the real issue is you don't get it by, through an assault on the First Amendment, which is more important. This is about health care. It's about prevention. Oh, it's it's mammograms. It's not about the sex. The mammograms are it's about sex. It's about preventing, you it, know, women. It is about things that are unacceptable to it's that our word church. Word. I am I, in that same church. I know. And this so, is unacceptable to that church. You know, that would have been a very uh, compelling argument back in 17th century England. Um, but it's confusing now. And the confusion seems to be between the rights of the authority structure of whichever church she belongs to and the rights of the individual and the freedom to choose to use birth control or not of the individual. Should the employer be able to argue that the individual has to bow to their moral value structure. And that's uh, a key point that we seem continually stuck on. I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, this is uh, an example of that common problem that we have. It's called the tragedy of the commons. Garrett Hardin wrote about it in 1968. What happens when we have not an unlimited pasture, as Adam Smith talked about, but a limited one? And with our global population of 7 billion, we're bumping up against our carrying capacity limits right now. Uh, every farmer thinks, what is the utility to me of adding one more cow? Well, I get one extra cow, but I don't pay the full cost in terms of excess uh, grazing, weeds, uh, uh, etc. in the common pasture. I outsource that. Uh, I dump it onto the global commons. Uh, but the problem is, is if every farmer thinks that way, pretty soon we have a bubble, an economic bubble. And an economic bubble is an environmental bubble. They're the same thing. The environment is the foundation of our economy. And sure enough, it's going to crash. And this is the fundamental conflict that we have to solve, that democracy is not very good at solving, especially American-style democracy. 
That's what we keep arguing about. The interest of the individual versus the interest of the commons. And that's the political science question, I think, of the century. Because all of these science issues that are also environmental issues that circle around that conflict are coming to a head. So science has really enabled us to uh, advance considerably, but it's also allowing us to push boundaries and, and face difficult political ethical questions that we may not want to. So I'm going to leave you with this idea, going back to regulation. Regulation plus science equals freedom. And I want you to think about that. Think about regulation without science. And you have the example of San Francisco Board of Supervisors. You have runaway regulation that is imposed by someone's ideological perspective. But if you use science to develop evidence, to come up with good policies that protect your health or that keep the stream clear, uh, you know, it used to be that somebody would say, why shouldn't I be able to dump stuff in the stream running along the back of my yard? Running stream cleans itself every 20 miles. They would think it was ridiculous that we'd have clean water regulations. Regulation plus science equals freedom. It's expanding all of our freedoms. Or you can flip that around. Freedom is science and regulation combined. Uh, it expanded our choice. And that's the juncture of science and democracy. Now, engineering is doing a lot. Back to the earlier question, I'm glad you brought that up. To try and tackle these issues, uh, the National Academy of Engineering has something called the Grand Challenges for Engineering. It's taking an uh, applied approach. How can we manage the nitrogen cycle? How can we create an artificial leak uh, and suck carbon dioxide back out of the atmosphere? We can find technological solutions. How can we develop cheap, safe fusion? That's going to put a lot of this aside. And that is what we've traditionally been able to do. We've been able to innovate our way out of it. But right now, we're not investing nearly as much in research as we have in the past. So, it, it, although we've had a big bump in the last two years. Uh, but that's the way we have to go if we're going to find those engineering solutions. Uh, so, I'm just uh, going to skip through some of this. Of course, well, I decided the last one. Uh, <laughs> Einstein in 1946 says everything is, said everything has changed, save our ways of thinking. And I think that that's very true uh, for all of these issues, uh, from uh, nuclear proliferation to any uh, science uh, issue that's challenging our country today. And back to Russia's point, I think we need to find ways to integrate evidence-based thinking back into our dialogue. So I'll leave you with this uh, closing thought. That there's an old saying in Tennessee, I know it's in Texas, probably in Tennessee, that says, fool me once, shame on me. shame on you. If fool me, you can't get fooled again. Thank you. particularly in the audience that have either work or evening classes to get to. So if you need to go, you may go. Please leave quietly. And we will uh, take the opportunity here for questions either for Sean or for Congressman Poole. Does anyone have any questions? Yep. All right, here we go. Um, as, uh, this is mainly for Rush, but obviously Sean. Why don't you come up so Rush can see you? Quality face time. I know, right? Yeah. We'll see. Um, as, as I guess, the maybe the token nerd or geek in uh, Congress, do you feel the responsibility to talk to your fellow uh, representatives when um, things like this are going on, or do you sort of have your own channels of uh, going about talking to them about technological issues? Oh, I, I, you know, I very much interact uh, with my colleagues, uh, both parties, uh, whenever I can. I, it, I find it curious that. Uh, a lot of members of Congress, uh, as I said earlier, most of whom are not uh, versed in science, uh, 
give me a lot of credit, uh, in fact, more than is due, uh, because I'm a scientist. Uh, you know, there's, there's this feeling out there that scientists must be really smart people. No, actually, <laughs> scientists are people who take advantage of a really smart structure uh, to help them behave more intelligently. Um, uh, that is uh, one, of the, one of the beauties of science. And members of Congress, by and large, have not, uh, have, have not discovered that yet. Uh, so that they, they don't, as I said earlier, think like scientists, nor do they um, know how to partake of the scientific um, uh, structure for good decision making. Um, so I, you know, whenever I can, I try to share it with them um, in, in, in a way that uh, you know makes it clear that uh, you know, the scientists are no smarter or more moral. Uh, or or uh, uh, more worthy uh, than any of them, uh, but that they could uh, learn from the from the process. Great question. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I have one for the congressman, one for Sean. Uh, especially on issues like climate change, how well do uh, the federal R and D agencies? Uh, explain their uh, results of their research to members of Congress, and, and maybe not just on on uh, climate change, but on other uh, broader science issues as well. Uh, and are there any that stand out as doing it particularly better than others? Well, some of them are really very good, um, but uh, in the policy circles. Uh, often people don't mis choose not to listen to them. Um, but, you know, uh, Secretary of Energy Chu, a Nobel Prize winner, uh, is, uh, you know, makes very intelligent points. Um, uh, you know, he, he suffers a little bit from the fact that most of his career has been talking to scientists. So he he still has kind of the, the techniques, uses the tropes that are, um, you know, found in science. Um, but I find my colleagues, for the most part, uh, choose not to listen to him, choose not to learn from what he would have to say. Uh, Jane Luchenko uh, of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, very good scientist, very good communicator, um, but. Uh, as often as not, my colleagues choose not to listen to her. Uh, they will sometimes lecture to her uh, about why we need more offshore. Uh, you know, even if she's not saying we don't. Uh, that's, uh, uh, so uh, there are, are many people around who are quite capable of good discussions of science. Um, but it takes two to have a discussion, and so often the discussions are, are missing or lacking. And then, Sean, where, in your discussion, where do the federal agencies fit in to try to help change the, the dynamics of what's going on? Well, it's very difficult for uh, federal employees, uh, particularly right now, uh, because they're prohibited by something called the Hatch Act from participating in partisan politics. And when science itself comes to be viewed as something that's partisan, it becomes more and more difficult for them uh, to discuss science issues uh, outside of their uh, role uh, as advisors if they're called on to advise the committee. Um, so it's, in which it's arguable that that's perhaps as it should be, uh, that government scientists really shouldn't be uh, advocating in, in policy ways. I don't know, Rush probably has more thoughts and insight into that than I do. Rush? No, not, not beyond, you know, I, I guess I don't right now. <laughs> okay, sorry to put you on the spot there. I'll ask a question. 
Um, based on what we just heard, I'm, I'm a scientist and my professional body has been advocating the idea that as we go to Washington for an NSF panel or a NASA panel or whatever, that we make time in our schedule to visit our Congress people and talk to them about what we do. Based on what we just yeah. heard, is it worth it? <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, oh, yes, yes, certainly. I mean, you, it's, it's too important not to, I guess is the way I would put it. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, members of, members of Congress, it's interesting, they value scientists because of the fruit of your work, uh, and they think scientists must be really smart. Uh, but it is a constant effort to get people in policy-making positions, uh, including members of Congress, to partake of the scientific decision-making process. Uh, you know, to this smart process that I was talking about. Um, but it's too important not to keep trying. Uh, one, one, um, a couple of things I guess I, sh I should say about uh, lobbying. It's not a dirty word. I mean, you, you should, as anybody from any uh, perspective, should, you know, take their, you know, the Constitution talks about people carrying their grievances, essentially, to their representatives. Well, it doesn't have to be negative grievances, either. It's to take your, your pers share your perspective uh, with members of Congress. Uh, you, you have an obligation to do that, um, and it's too important not to. The technique I would advise is storytelling. And this applies not just to members of Congress. If you ever want to influence somebody else's thinking, uh, don't try charts and graphs. It doesn't work. Uh, try an anecdote. Now, the anecdote, the, the, the moral of the anecdote should not be contrary to the conclusions of the charts and graphs. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, tell a story. I, I would just add to that, well, you come, come up, you keep coming. Just from my experience on the other side of my brain, um, I, I want to reemphasize that storytelling component. Um, politics is really an emotion-driven business, and that's what story is about, is the world of emotions. So if you can contain the intellectual message and, and the emotional structure of a story, you can make it lift in a way that a politician can really understand. Uh, so my question is kind of directed at both of you, uh, or whoever wants to answer it, I guess. Uh, how do you see the role of engineers and scientists moving forward to fix this divide between politics and policy and politics and engineering and science in general? Rush, do you want to start or do you want me to? Well, yeah, I, uh, um, I, I'm sorry I wasn't more clear in my remarks because that's really what uh, partly what I was getting at, uh, you know, get involved, uh, you know, get get over the the impasse, get over the hurdles uh, that society and your discipline put in the way, uh, and get involved. Uh, I I talked about you know why aren't there more scientists in Congress? I'm not saying that the first thing you should do is run for Congress. Uh, not a bad idea, but uh, <laughs> there are there are a thousand of other a thousand other ways uh, to get involved uh, in the political and policy making process. Everything from your you know the local environmental uh, commission in your town to uh, uh, you know to national politics. Um, there. Uh, Sean uh, did it with his uh, science debate, which, which you know, even though the debates never took place, the the, uh, the, the process probably helped matters a lot. Um, and uh, there, whether it's informal advising of of politicians uh, and getting involved in their campaigns, uh, or um, 
or, or, or developing policy papers with the uh, you know American Society of Micro American Society of Microbiology and the American Physical Society and the American Geophysical Society or uh, take so there are all of those things to do and uh, yeah, everybody should to the extent that their professional life family life uh, and you know uh, personal sanity uh, allow. I think that that's true. A uh, recent Q survey showed that um, most Americans uh, couldn't name a living scientist, <clears throat> even though they are in their communities everywhere. So that's really got to change. Something happened, as, and Rush alluded to this after Sputnik, uh, and part of that was because uh, we went to uh, government-funded science. Uh, the uh, guy named Vannevar Bush, who had led the U.S. science war effort, uh, really pushed uh, for the foundation of the NSF because the benefits that science could provide us in peacetime were the same as in war. And they really have paid off the United States since World War II. Science has powered more than half of our economic development and made us into the world's preeminent power. So it's a very good investment, but the way that it is structured, and this is changing now, didn't require any public outreach component. Uh, for scientists who got public grants. And that was a strategic mistake that was tragic uh, because scientists turned to their labs. Uh, many scientists are not particularly gifted communicators to begin with, uh, and, uh, but many are. Uh, and without a reward structure in place, in fact, with a tenure system that is a big disincentive in many cases to doing public outreach, uh, it became very difficult for scientists to reach out. And they removed themselves from the public dialogue. So what Rush is advocating, I really endorse, get back involved in the public dialogue. The NSF now is actually uh, pushing that with a public outreach requirement component in their grant making. Uh, but scientists can do that just in their local community, serving on the school board or, or an advisory com capacity to any member of Congress or to a member of the state house or a, a state senate, just call them up. They probably won't have a science advisor, volunteer for the job. John, uh, at NASA now, the this, this, uh, grants, grants funded by the science division, 1% of that money has to be spent on public. Uh, okay, good, right. NASA's doing it too. Great, excellent, good, thank you. We we'll probably have time for one more question. And then we Basically, need to... what's, uh, is there gonna be a science division that's involved? Or how, uh, yes, we're working on it. Uh, in 2008, what they did do is they exchanged uh, answers online, which was actually really helpful, uh, and it wound up making about uh, 850 million media impressions. So it gave the media an angle to begin to cover science, which we thought was really important. Uh, so we're doing the same kind of thing again uh, this year. We're also, we have a new uh, facility up on our website at sciencedebate.org uh, called Questions. Dot science debate dot org, uh, where you guys can submit questions that the candidates for president ought to answer, and you can vote up or down questions that are already there. So please go online, participate, and uh, help us push that forward. Okay, well, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.